board going directly into executive session under the following ORS. ORS 192-660-2D to conduct deliberations with persons designated by the governing body to carry on labor negotiations. It is now 6 p.m. and we are reconvening our meeting with the public session, which is a business session. We have um, all board members present. Director Enojos Presi will be joining virtually soon. She's on. She is on. She's on virtually. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask our student advisor to read the land acknowledgement this evening. Thank you. We are gathered today on the land of the Kalapuya, who are represented by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Round and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. The relationship between the Kalapuya people and this land continues unbroken to this day, and we offer gratitude for the land and for the generations present and past who have stewarded the land since time immemorial. We respectfully acknowledge and honor past, present, and future Native American and Indigenous students and staff of Salem-Kaiser Public Schools. We invite you to join us in honoring, honoring these ancestral grounds and celebrating the resilience and strength of all Native American and Indigenous people. Thank you, Student Advisor Linda Papas, and just want to acknowledge that our Student Advisor Patrick is now with us this evening. Um, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Superintendent Castaneda, do we have any agenda modifications this evening? No, we do not. Great. So we're just going to jump right into our spotlights for success. Uh, it appears that folks are mostly set up with um, interpreting devices, which we'll need for this portion. So I'll turn it kindly over to Superintendent Castaneda for this. Thank you so much. And I am turning, I'm actually just going to turn it right over to our very own Yuri Coronado, and she will lead us through this amazing spotlight for the Coalition for Equality. Okay, I'll be reading in Spanish. Buenas noches, Presidente Guzmán Ortiz, miembros de la Junta Directiva, asesores estudiantiles y Superintendente <coughs> Castañeda. Esta noche estamos emocionados de descatar a una organización dedicada a marcar la diferencia en la vida de padres y familias en la comunidad de Salem-Kaiser. La Coalición por la Igualdad de Salem-Kaiser está activamente comprometida en empoderar y elevar las voces de nuestras familias latinas e hispanas, proporcionándoles las herramientas y recursos necesarios para acceder a servicios familiares saludables, capacitación, um, educación y oportunidades de liderazgo. La Coalición de la esta, um, ha establecido sólidas alianzas con nuestro distrito a la comunidad en, y con la comunidad en general. Su esfuerzo colectivo está dirigido a mejorar los, los resultados de los estudiantes latinos y sus familias. La Coalición por la Igualdad de Salem-Kaiser va más allá de los programas y servicios que ofrecen. Además de sus servicios, son defensores del cambio. Aseguran que las voces y las experiencias de los estudiantes y familias latinas sean consideradas por los responsables de las políticas y administradores. Incluso durante momentos de desafíos acentuados durante la pandemia, su organización continuó apoyando a nuestros estudiantes um, proporcionando preparación para el jardín de infantes en casa, en casa a través de las clases en línea. Su trabajo siempre tiene un impacto significativo en las vidas de quienes sirven. Agradecemos al equipo completo de la Coalición por la Igualdad de Salem-Kaiser por sus valiosas contribuciones a la comunidad de Salem-Kaiser y rendimos homenaje a su dedicación inquebrantable al acceso y éxito para todos. Gracias. Gracias.
gracias por acompañarnos. Es un honor tenerlas aquí esta tarde y poder eh, agradecerles y celebrarles un poquito. I also just want to add, I've had several wonderful experiences at the coalition. Um, it is such a magical and warm place for our families and for the culture that you guys are just lifting up every day. So I, I want to thank you for what you're doing and also for the way that you've welcomed me. Muchas gracias. Okay, I think that our next spotlight, we will now turn over to Sandy Price um, and we will hear about our Native American program. Thank you. Okay, we'll start again. <laughs> Good evening, Chair Guzman Ortiz, Board of Directors, Student Advisors, and Superintendent Castañeda. Tonight, I am joined by the district's exceptional Native Education Program. If you are unfamiliar with this program, they serve our students, families, and tribal partners in a rich, vibrant, and inclusive way. Program staff also provide professional development and presentations to schools and other department staff around Native cultures and life ways, and the Native Education Program services, which include academic coaching, Native clubs, enrichment nights, summer school, and support with attendance and a sense of belonging. Earlier this month, this team, in partnership with our very strong Parent Advisory Committee and the Oregon Native American Education Foundation, held the American Indian Alaska Native celebration with over 200 people in attendance as an observance of National Native American Month and Indigenous Peoples Day. The AIAN celebration has provided a full community opportunity to participate and learn more within the Native community. Native clubs have been a big hit in the schools. By putting together Native students and Native student allies to learn more about culture and provide time and space to build connections, enrichment nights and summer school are gateways to multi-generational families to participate in a Native cultural and educational event, supporting connections with other families in the community, which then grows our students' sense of belonging in powerful ways. This program is built upon not just program staff, but parents, community foundations, and tribes. It's not just one group of people or staff only. The program promotes academics, but not academics alone. Social, emotional, cultural, and sense of belonging to provide a whole child system of support and celebration of cultures and life ways. Culturally, the belief system looks at the whole child with cultural support as wellness and wholeness for the child, for the family, and for the community. This team is grateful for the spotlight on the Native Education Program and is proud to share it with the Parent Advisory Committee that supports our students as well. Thank you for all that you do to support our students. Thank you all, and thanks for bearing with us as we try to figure out, you know, what's then the best mechanism to get, um, to capture the moment yes. as we come back in person. Um, I will also like to add that I was one of the 200 people that attended that very magical night at SeaTech. Um, it was a great event. It was um, full of joy and happiness and also excellent food. Excellent food. <laughs> um, and uh, there were also these wonderful speakers. And one of the speakers said something that I wrote down and I've been thinking about. Um, he said, whatever we're going through right now, we are strong enough to go through. Our elders have proven that. And I just found a lot of kind of power and wisdom in that idea. So I want to thank you guys for bringing 
that to the community and for inviting me to be part of it. It was really wonderful. I, I want to echo that. Um, I was there. I don't know that you saw me, Superintendent. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a beautiful evening, you know, being there, being at a fundraiser over the summer also, and just being able to see how bringing community, bringing families, bringing the youngest children and having them at this latest event, right? Just rejoice in, in the wisdom and the word and the poetry and the music and the song mm -hmm. and to use that as a learning opportunity. So just huge appreciation for all of the work that's happening across the district and in specific schools. Okay. So we will move on to our third spotlight. Um, I believe I'm going to be turning this over to Jennifer Neitzel, who will be honoring a student. We have Owen Marksbury. So good evening, um, Chair Guzman-Ortiz, Board Director, Student Advisors, and Cas uh, Superintendent Castaneda. I'm thrilled to be here today to recognize and introduce you to Owen Marksbury, who's a fifth grader at Kalapuya. We're here tonight to highlight Owen and his accomplishments of being named as a Scholastic Kid Reporter. But I'd also like to tell you about the amazing person and student that Owen is. Owen's a hard worker in class. He is as on our student leadership team, part of our SOAR team. So he gets up and leads our school assemblies each month. As a SOAR leader, he's a role model. So he actually goes into the younger classrooms. He gets to recognize uh, students in younger classrooms for being on task and working hard and reward them uh, with classroom SOAR tickets. And earlier this year, he was recognized as uh, one of only 28 worldwide uh, student writers for Scholastic News. So he's the only one from the Pacific Northwest. And uh, there's students from 17 different states and eight other countries. And so he gets to write with students all throughout the world, which is so exciting. Owen's favorite book is The Lord of the Rings, and he hopes to one day be an author or a teacher. And I said, Owen, great news. You could do both, and you could actually come back and teach in Salem-Kaiser. So we're trying to recruit him. Anyway, Owen, we're so proud of this accomplishment and are thankful that you're part of our Calapuya Condor family. Great job, Owen. Uh, thank you so much. I also want to share something with Owen, now that I know about the Lord of the Rings connection. Um, when I was in middle school, I wrote uh, my name in Elvish around all of my basketball shoes. So just so you know, I see you. <laughs> um, okay, I think I'll have to turn it back over to the chairwoman. Yeah, thank you, Owen. Thanks for joining us, and, th and congrats on all the amazing work. Um, it is now time for our public comment portion of the school board meeting and just have a few things to know as we move forward into this section. Again, remind... Superintendent. Oh my goodness. Oh, I, sorry y'all, I'm jumping ahead. We're not quite there yet. We are actually going on to superintendent's reports. Thank you, Second okay. Vice Chair Carson Cottingham. Um, so superintendent's report, it's actually back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'll be making some more extensive comments tonight about the budget, but I am going to use this opportunity um, to actually do the kind of formal but brief reporting out on my first hundred days and specifically the things that I committed to doing over that hundred day period. Um, today is actually, I believe, 1.30. I did the math. I think it is 1.37. So you'll have to give me 37 days of grace in um, offering this somewhat timely report. Um, it has been a really amazing 137 days. And without exception, every day I woke up <laughs> excited about what I'm going to see, who I'm going to meet, what I'm going to learn, and what I'm going to do. Um, it's really just been an amazing experience so far. And if you can go to the next slide, I'm just going to pause briefly here um, to offer a few thoughts about each of these values. I did um, include these in my introductory documents, and I just have about one or two sentences to say about each one. Um, so first, personal value being community-based. Um, I've been working for over 20 years, and I've only ever been in three communities. It's because I love to be in a place and stay in a place and meet the people there. 
it's part of the reason that I even love looking at the members of the coalition in the front row because I'm just new, but I feel like we're part of a community. And it is incredibly important to me to feel that way about the place I am in. Second one, really about being future focused. I love the idea about being optimistic about the future. Um, there may be challenges, but fundamentally, I think that tomorrow is going to be better than yesterday. And I always have felt that way. It's one of the gifts of working with young people is you have a reason to feel that way almost every day. Student centered, I think probably everyone in this room is constantly making decisions about what is best for students. And over the course of my daily decision making and daily experiences, I do try to pass my thinking through two tests, which is, will this decision help students and how do I know that? And the second test is, are there any students that will be harmed by this decision and how do I know that? Those two questions are kind of touchstones for me and try to keep me centered on what matters most. Um, hopeful. Hope is different than optimism for me. I feel sunny about the idea of tomorrow, but it's because I believe action is what makes things better. So for me, hope comes from the certainty that actions, our actions together will make things better for our communities, for our students, for our staff. And I always feel hopeful. And then finally, grateful. I will only stop to say that people in my family or people in my past will sometimes say, well, what's it like to be superintendent? And my answer is always the same, every single time. It's better than I ever hoped. That's how it is for me. And that makes me feel grateful every day. For every one of you in the room, every member of the board, every member of the team, I feel grateful every day. So, okay, moving on. Um, next slide, please. I felt hopeful that I would complete 100% of my um, 65 commitments. I'm sliding in at an approximate A minus with 91%. Um, but that was a lot of activity in 100 days. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of very quick highlights just to kind of get a feel for what those days and what those commitments looked and felt like. Um, so first on the community engagement front, um, I have joined, you know, I don't know, well over a dozen community-based events, participated, spoken, danced, generally enjoyed being a member of so many small communities that make up our larger community. I've met with over two dozen electeds. Um, we've hosted the community conversations where we've reached, I think, easily 12 or 1300 people over the course of the six events. Um, we have also um, a very committed and amazingly wise transition team. About 20 people serve on a superintendent's transition team. We've met monthly and will continue to do so. Um, and I've just generally been all over the city learning, speaking, and meeting people. On the teaching and learning front, um, I have visited a little over half of our schools for varying amounts of time, sometimes long visits, sometimes short. Um, and I've been in over 100 classrooms. I know that I've been in over 100 classrooms because in my evenings, I make these little note cards. Um, almost every teacher who I visit ends up with a note after the visit. And I count my visits based on the number of tassels I have to buy off Amazon. So I'm into my second Amazon packet. <laughs> um, we stood up a student cabinet and a teacher advisory committee. Um, I've been learning about dual language and learning about our other programs, our career and technical education, and just generally trying to learn as much as I can about the heart of our system, which is what goes on in our classrooms. Um, on the board front, um, area three, we did host a retreat. We've moved forward with strong, clearly stated, measurable board goals. And I've spent um, time, energy, and a lot of care working to build a trusting and frank relationship with every member of this board and will absolutely continue that work. 
And then finally, on the operational front, I have reviewed in detail all aspects of operations, but it is a surprise to no one that I've spent the majority of my time on finance where we have had a time, had time as a team to do a very deep and rigorous review. And we will talk about that more later in the meeting. Um, this has also included making sure that I understand how our system is funded and how it has come to be that our system is funded at a fundamentally unfair level when compared to our regional partners. That sets the basis for long-term work that I believe can help reset and change the trajectory, at least the financial trajectory of our school district. Um, I believe there, is there one more slide? Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so I'm gonna close out just by saying the community conversations were part of my 100-day plan, but I, more importantly, they were experiences that we, many of us had together. Um, so we completed one in each theater pattern. There were, I believe, between probably about 150 and 200 people at each one, and we learned a lot from them. Amongst some of the highlights, um, one, we learned that many members of our community, and especially our parents, are deeply, deeply invested in the relationships their students have with our staff. We heard story after story about magical staff members. They believe that that is the most important part of what happens in our schools. I think we all share that belief. We also heard a lot about the importance of sports and arts, um, music, extracurriculars, AVID. These are over and over we heard the story that this is what brings our students to school every day and what keeps them engaged. And then I'll finally say, we heard a lot about class size, about reasonableness of the um, experience for teachers and also reasonableness of the experience for students. Sense of belonging, one of the five board priorities definitely outshone the rest in um, the public perception of its importance and the way that it's kind of the centerpiece of much of what else happens that is good and powerful in our schools. So that is a very quick wrap on the community conversations, and I will turn it back over to the chairwoman. Thank you. Thank you. Are there? Public comment. I'm trying to make sure I'm on task here. Um, thank you, Superintendent Castaneda, for that. We now will ease into public comment this time for real and I'll just recap some of the um, notes before we, we jump in so as a reminder we've selected speakers at random and provide an opportunity for public pu public comment by Colin zoom in person and in writing and have allotted 30 minutes to to this tonight all commenters will be in person each participant has three minutes. Electronic mechanisms are used for translation and we'll have a countdown timer on the screen for monitoring time. It'll go down from 30, three minutes to 30 seconds and turn green and yellow at one second. It, at one second, it'll turn red and play a short bell. Um, again, please be mindful about your pace for our interpreters and I think that's a good reminder for us all. If the board that receives written comment ahead of the meeting, it will be posted on the district website. So I believe you can expect some of that for this meeting as well. And tonight we have eight uh, folks providing public comments. So I'll go through and just call people up if that's all right. And please excuse me and feel free to correct me if I mispronounce your name. First, we have Kimberly Reed Zauber. And just as a reminder, I believe the mic needs the button held down for the, um, it, is it, it? It's live. It's live. Okay. We have a live mic tonight. Yes. You don't have to hold it. Thank you. Good evening, Chairperson Guzman Ortiz, Board Directors, Cabinet, Superintendent Castaneda. I'm Kimberly Reed Zauber, she, her. I'm a dual language science teacher at Parish Middle School. I'm speaking as an individual. I have some clarification to offer. 
There seems to be some misunderstanding about our union's desires to complete contract negotiations quickly. We've heard the superintendent state repeatedly that the district requested mediation with our teachers union in order to accelerate the contract negotiations process. The real situation is that since bargaining began on April 6, the district bargaining team has put off addressing the most important parts of our proposals. After the district requested mediation, the union still asked that they honor those four calendar dates that we already had for bargaining and never got any response. Six weeks later, when our first mediation session was canceled by the mediator, the union again asked that the district treat that date as a bargaining session, and again, no response. The district also has refused to bargain any significant proposals from our support staff union. This union finally felt compelled to request mediation in order to make progress in the negotiations. Our unions are doing everything that they can to bring negotiations to a quick and acceptable resolution, while the district seems to be dragging its feet at every step. There also seems to be a little misunderstanding about our priorities. District advertising talks only about money, but falls silent on both of our union's proposals to support students, like class size and caseload caps, timely intervention and placement for students with special needs, time for prep, healthy working and learning environments, protection and support surrounding traumatic student incidents. I mean, it took until October 16th just for the district to agree to restroom access at schools for our bus drivers so that transportation can be on time. Our union's proposals seek to improve service at our schools, while district admin appears to focus on service to the central administration. Don't be fooled by the way that the central admin is painting this negotiation process. They may be louder because they already have taxpayer-funded publicity and infrastructure, but our union's voices speak for our students, and we will be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Eddie Buchanan? Buchanan. Buchanan. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, Edie. <laughs> I was so focused on the last name. <laughs> Thank you. So this is live. Can you yes. hear me okay? Yes. All right. Good evening, board chair and board leaders. My name is Edie Buchanan, president of Ask ESP. Tonight I am speaking on behalf of 2,900 plus classified members to thank you for the recognition on National ESP Day. While we appreciate the words, frankly, words do not put food on our tables, pay our rent, prevent us from being injured, pay the bills, and simply do not help us thrive, nor our children. I'm compelled to remind you that many of our classified workers have children and grandchildren who attend Salem Kaiser schools. And sadly, over several decades, classified staff are clearly not the priority in this district. When our workers are not paid a living wage and are kept in poverty, their children, SKSD's children, suffer and remain in poverty. I am astounded that you do not grasp this reality. It is disappointing to hear time and time again how important students are to you in student achievement, but your actions show the opposite. For Salem Kaiser's children to achieve, the workers who educate and support them need to be treated with value and respect. Our association endorsed many of you on the school board with the expectation that we, the workers, the students, and the community would finally have a watchdog over how the leaders of Salem Kaiser treat their workers, educate our children and our grandchildren, and above all, prioritize spending to make sure our hard-earned tax dollars are spent supporting schools, classrooms, and those who work directly with our dearest souls, our children. Our membership is tired of our needs being unmet, tired of our being understaffed, tired of being hurt, tired of not having a living wage, and unsafe working conditions, and tired of all our children not getting the quality education they deserve. Our association has made many proposals at the bargaining table that have addressed these serious issues, 
SKSD's bargaining team's response has been no, no, no. Now, on top of all workers have to endure for decades, we are being made to be the scapegoat in our community by SKSD leadership and you. You are backing them with the propaganda of fear and intimidation. So the message is loud and clear. If we dare seek more than what we have been offered, we will bankrupt SKSD schools and it will be ASK's fault and children will suffer. This tactic by new Superintendent Castaneda is supposed to bring our community together, implies privilege, being out of touch, and is downright dishonest. All of this on top of the outrageous raises that you approved to administrators and supervisors on the backs of ESPs and students while expecting us to settle for a 4% increase that doesn't even keep up with inflation. Shame on all of you. As an association, we are appalled with your message. We will counter your message with facts for the sake of our careers and our students. Do better. Thank you. Tyler Lakeberg. I will someday get these names right. <laughs> Welcome, Tyler. Okay. Good evening, school board chairs, director, superintendent, and student advisors. I'm Tyler Skella Lakeberg, the president of the Salem Kaiser Education Association, SKEA, speaking on behalf of my members. Tonight, I want to talk to you about change. For many, change can be difficult. I've always viewed change as an opportunity for new opportunities. We know change can bring positive experiences or regrets. This year, Salem Kaiser Schools has had a big change in leadership. We welcomed new ideas, new perspectives, and hope for furthering the relationship between the district and SKEA. It has only been a few months into the school year, and I'm saddened to say that the relationship between SKEA and this district is at an all-time low. We understand that there will be differences of opinion. However, we had a relationship built on trust and collaboration that no longer exist. SKA is now experiencing a very different type of interaction. And to be clear, this has nothing to do with bargaining. In just over two months, SKA has multiple unfair labor practices being filed, numerous contractual grievances, and soon to enter arbitration. This is a high, uh, all time record high, and more legal action is on its way. And due to recent events, there is now a complete break in trust between SKA and this district district. In May, the associations and Salem Kaiser schools entered a consultation process with OSHA. Legal counsel was brought in and both the associations and district entered into a joint agreement with hopes of establishing safety within our schools. OSHA did a thorough investigation into the practices systems uh, within Salem Kaiser regarding student caused injuries, safety committees, and other high importance overarching concerns. On October 16th of this year, the final OSHA report was delivered to the district with instructions from OSHA, based on our mutual agreement, that the report be shared with the associations. However, the district failed to notify or deliver that report. Let me restate, the district had the final report from OSHA for almost three weeks with no intention to share this report. They completely disregarded our agreed shared agreement. I wanna know, have you folks seen this full report? You might want to look at it. At this point, all trust is broken. And at the end of October, there have been almost 400 student cause injuries since the beginning of the school year. Clearly, safety is not a priority for this district, nor is having a transparent relationship built on trust and collaboration a priority. We know that the issues we are facing in this district will only be resolved through partnership and joint problem solving. This means a relationship based on mutual trust, transparency, and collaboration between SKA and the district. Thank you. All right, um, Brian Sauber Reed. Hey, everyone hear me okay? Awesome. 
Well, good evening, Chair, Board of Directors, Cabinet Directors, Superintendent. My name is Brian Zavarid. I'm an educator and classified staff at Judson Middle School, and I'm speaking as an individual. Public education and administration across the state and nation have operated far too long, exploiting the goodwill and passions of educators. Salem, Salem Kaiser School District has been added to this trend by yearly adding more meetings, more PDs, more forms to fill, more procedures to follow during that small amount of time that is allotted for educators to effectively serve our students. This happens because our director, superintendent, and even you, the school board, seems to have no real notion of what's, what it means to be an educator for the, student, for the students in our schools today. Our leaders in the district could check out learning conditions in our schools. They could talk to our students, visit the staff. They can get, get educator input on identifying district uh, priorities. They can even visit a school, any classroom, any time, but they don't, at least not without a camera crew. <laughs> uh, and not in any of the uncomfortable and unhealthy parts in the building. Salem Kaiser School District needs leaders that who work with students and the community and staff to improve our services, not just balance an extremely top heavy budget, but we need leaders who know the current education landscape and know our people. We need leaders who don't wreak havoc in our community schools before moving to the next. That sort of leadership might work in other states, but in Oregon, we love our public education and we don't like closing our schools. I assume you've heard about the letter of uh, no confidence with our superintendent. I'd like to extend that and cover the, uh, our cabinet as well, unfortunately. Our two unions bargaining motto is stronger together and it's about time. Folks, we are stronger at working together and with our students and families not around them. And it's about time we had district administrators who haven't cast aside their passions for education and their love for students. It's about time for our district to, to be led by current and knowledgeable and dedicated educators from our own ranks, not by career administrators who bounce from district to district in pursuit of money and power. We are a service organization and we, are, we want leaders who serve. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Christina McFarland up next. Good evening. I am Christina McFarland and I am speaking on behalf of myself and other special educators. I am both a special programs instructional assistant in an LRC and a mother of a teenager who has been on an IEP for over a decade. My experience with student behavior tracking has been varied and chaotic in this district. On a personal level as a parent, I keep track of my son's behavior patterns due to his autism and knowing that he isn't a very communicative person. Once he got into middle school, this became more challenging as that meant multiple teachers and multiple locations that needed to be tracked. The flaw in the system came roaring to the surface last month when it was revealed that he had been being bullied for over five years, which had escalated to sexual harassment, and I was never informed. Thankfully, the situation was resolved when I insisted on a meeting with the entire team, but the staff should have been able to coordinate that without my instigation. However, there was never any system in place. On the professional side of things, I have been part of discussions on improving the tracking system without ever having seen results. In the eight years I have worked in this school district, there has never been a time that I have used the same tracking system two years in a row. The systems vary from school to school and there has never been clear information about what that data is even being used for. No consistent discipline matrix exists, letting staff know what should be done in any given circumstance. This has led to students hitting teachers and other students 
being sent out of the class to talk to someone and then coming back a short time later with a treat and a grin on their face. Now, don't get me wrong, this isn't happening everywhere. And there are schools that have taken steps to correct these issues at their school level. But there needs to be district level guidance. And the community deserves to know what progress is being made. Too many staff members are being injured repeatedly by students throwing tantrums or intentionally choosing violence. These are behaviors that need to be addressed with more than just a say you're sorry and don't do it again. What happened to zero tolerance? Every time I bring this up, I am told two things, either that the student deserves a free and public education or that there aren't enough staff members to deal with the issue. With a proper matrix, this wouldn't be an issue. The administration needs to pull, to stop holding advisory panels and pull the trigger on a finished product. We need it for our students and they deserve consistency. And for the record, PBIS is not a discipline matrix. Thank you. Uh, Jared Ratliff. Good evening, directors, chairs, superintendent. Uh, I'm here tonight as uh, a member of SKEA to share a story called The Night Watchman. Once upon a time, the government had a vast scrapyard in the middle of the desert. Congress said someone may steal from it at night. So they created a night watchman position and hired a person for the job. Then Congress said, how does the watchman do his job without instruction? So they created a planning department, hired two people, one to write the instructions and one to study the amount of time it took for the watchman to do his job. Then Congress said, how will we know the night watchman is doing his tasks correctly? So they created a quality control department hired two more people, one to do the studies, and one to write the reports. Then Congress said, how are these people going to get paid? So they created the following positions, a timekeeper, a payroll officer, and hired those two people. Then Congress said, who will be accountable for all these people? So they created an administrative section and hired an administrative officer, assistant administrative officer, and a legal secretary. Then Congress said, we've had this command and operation for over a year and we are $18,000 over budget. We must cut back the overall cost. So they laid off the night watchman. While this story is satirical, we truly hope it's not allegorical. We know the district must make cuts. After all, over the last few years, enrollment has decreased and hiring has increased. However, much like this story, all the hiring apart from the night watchman was at an administrative level, very similar to the hiring that has occurred within this district. We hope this is where the comparison ends and the cuts will be to write a top heavy organization and not cut the very people who are directly serving our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Uh, Kelsey Miller. Good evening, my name is Kelsey Miller and I'm a current middle school science teacher, a proud SKEA member and a Salem resident who cares deeply about this community. Tonight I'm speaking to you on behalf of myself and my colleagues. I would like to start by reading an excerpt from a letter written by one of our current elementary teachers to Governor Kotek. I've been an elementary school teacher in the Salem-Kaiser School District since 1996. This has never been an easy job. I dig deeply every day to find patience for students who are struggling and provide my students the best I can. But this year, more than any other year, teachers are being asked to persevere through conditions that are not, would not be tolerated in any other professional setting. We have a record number of elementary age children coming to school in pull-ups, requiring adults to change them multiple times a day. At my school, there is such a high need for this that our behavior specialist, instructional mentor, and our principal often find themselves on diaper duty. We also have a dramatic increase in violent and destructive behaviors. Last school year, as well as this school year, we've had staff members suffer facial lacerations, scratched corneas, concussions, bruises, 
and other injuries at the hands of students. A lawsuit has been brought by our union on our behalf, but instead of seeing improvements this year, conditions have gotten worse. We are seeing even higher numbers of students with extreme behaviors in general education settings without the proper support. We also have huge classes this year. There are 36 students in my fifth grade math class. I have students making animal noises, crawling on the floor, and knocking over desks while I'm trying to teach them decimal place value. In all of my 27 years teaching in Salem, I've never felt less supported or respected. There are hundreds more stories like this and letters like this that I could read you tonight. Our educators are struggling. We want to have great public schools for all kids. We want to give everything for our students and families, but we cannot do it alone. We need the district to hear us, to prioritize the things that we, those in the classrooms every day, are telling you we need. We need class size caps. We need caseload caps. We need supports and structures in place for students in crisis. We need early interventions for our youngest learners who are struggling the most. We need those same early learners to have time to play, climb, invent, imagine, explore, and run. We need resources in our buildings. We need time within our workday to effectively do the job we are hired to do. We need reasonable expectations on what can be accomplished in an eight hour workday and a 40 hour work week. We need to be treated and paid like the professionals we are. We need you to listen to us, believe us, respect us, and trust us. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, Marlene Ellis, Marilyn. Good evening, school board director, student advisor, and superintendent. My name is Marilyn Ellis. I'm the SKEA vice president. The district recently presented budget information at community listening sessions, and that's all the community was allowed to do, listen. Rather than receive comments or answer questions, the district prefers to prevent, present a simplified document with no clear categories of spending to support their version of a budgetary crisis. In fact, among the documents contained in the packet for tonight is a report for the quarter ending September 30th. There are inaccuracies in this report. The state school fund was increased from a projected $9.9 billion to $10.2 billion. The increase allocated to Salem-Kaiser as a result of this is listed as approximately on the form that you have, $9.9 million. By our calculations, it should be at least $22 million. Find a calculator, do the math. We have found over and over again that the district presents data as factual, when in reality it is rife with either mistakes or outright misrepresentation. This became clear during the superintendent's messages about the percentage of salary increase provided to licensed staff. Bad math and misrepresentation included step increases as overall pay increases on top of using different methods of averaging to inflate their data about pay increases. We had to do a formal information request to get the explanation of how they arrived at their numbers because when we asked, they were unable to provide a verbal explanation during a bargaining session. Additionally, I encourage you to look carefully at ESSER spending. Much of last year's spending was on one-time purchases, like curriculum, yet these one-time expenses are rolled over into the next year unnecessarily. This is like putting a roof on your house this year and budgeting for a roof next year and the next and so on. It's something none of us would do unless we were trying to inflate the level of a possible budget shortfall. These experiences have led us to question every financial number coming from the district. School board directors, I hope you are questioning those numbers as well before you put a stamp of approval on them. On a final note, you may be aware that the district printed postcards and mailed them out to the students of Salem-Kaiser, students of all ages. These postcards said, we need your help to bridge the budget gap. Additionally, it said, we are spending more than we receive in school funding. My question to you is, who writes the budget that allows spending more than revenue? Who approves that budget? 
Asking children as young as five years old to find ideas to curtail spending is absolutely ludicrous, and it flies in the face of every value I hold dear as a teacher. There is no need to make children fear their future. They need and deserve to feel safe. Our district's in trouble. We've strayed off course. We can find our way back through open and honest collaboration, or we can follow in Portland's footsteps. The power to control next steps lies with our district leadership. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your time and your comments. We'll go ahead and move now to a, let's do a quick break. Let's come back at 7.10. Am I reading that correctly? Yes, okay, so we'll be back at 7.10.
Thank you, everyone. We're back. At this time, we'll move on to our consent calendar. Uh, Superintendent Castaneda, is there anything we'd, you'd like to provide any further review um, regarding the consent calendar? No, there's not. All right. All right, so at this moment, we... Oh. Oh, I see Director you know, Hos Presti has her hand up. Oh, I was just waiting to make the motion to approve the consent calendar. Thank you. All right, we have a motion. I would like to pull an item. And we have Director Chandraguri asking to pull an item. I will get this down. Um, what item are you asking to pull, Director Chandraguri? I would like to pull the item on the native... Uh, Item B. Yeah, sorry. Which yeah, reads that, approved Native American Heritage yeah, Month proclamation. Heritage. All right, so do you have a motion to approve the consent calendar with the exception of item B? Yes, I do. I will make that motion. All right, I'll go ahead and- I will second that motion. Take uh, Director Enoch Presley's motion as first and Director Avila's as second. Um, all those in favor of approving the consent calendar with the exception of item B, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 All right, I see a unanimous vote on that. And I'll bring it back to Director Chandragiri. Uh, would you like to share about the pulled item? Yeah, I, I just wanted to pull this item to recognize the significance of uh, not only the proclamation that we are passing but also the importance of the Senate Bill 13 and the shared history, tribal history, shared history curriculum that had originally envisioned implementing in K-12 all. And I, th I think it is an important uh, focus that we should keep and hopefully uh, make that happen because I had an opportunity to participate in a research study by a researcher who was doing the implementation of Senate Bill uh, 13. And finally, the completed uh, dissertation is available. I can share it with the board for the record. And uh, granted, this is a statewide problem, but we need to focus on this because for a lot of uh, tribal history would be lost. And it is for everybody. It's everybody's shared history. The languages are at risk in some of the languages, in some certain tribes, both in federally recognized and in Oregon. So I really feel this is an important piece. Several of the community members who are part of the Native uh, Parent Association have personally brought this concern to me. And I would really like to lift, elevate their voice here in this discussion to see how worried they are, uh, if this is not fully implemented, then their languages could be lost. There are hardly few members left, or their story will not be carried on in our state and to their children and others, especially when they are all participating in the public education. Jefferson mm -hmm. School District, I believe, there, there is a lot of work has been done. Hopefully, we can get and uh, uh, some help from them to see how they have worked on this topic and they have done a good job and their director also received the school board director OSBA uh, you know school board director of the year award a few years ago so I really feel there is a lot of work we can do and there is a lot of help available so I hope we keep that also in the focus so with that, I would be supporting, and I would urge all my fellow board directors to please support this, and let's translate the resolution into action. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, um, do we have a motion to approve? I would move that we approve the Native American Heritage Month proclamation. All right, and Director, you know, host Presti, I see your hand. Uh, yeah, I will um, go ahead and uh, second that, but um, I did just want to jump in and see if maybe we could get 
in a future superintendent's update, just the status on that curriculum implementation in the district. Because, I mean, definitely recognizing what Director Shandagiri is saying across the state being an issue, but I, I would like to make sure that we have sound and current data about how our district is implementing that Senate bill. Yeah, uh, we'd be pleased to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, those in support of approving item B, of approving the Native American Heritage Heritage Month Proclamation, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 All right, thank you. And we have a unanimous approval of it. Um, we move on to readings and discussion for this portion and we'll have Deputy Superintendent Cobb join us and walk us through a brief overview of the fall literacy report. We have some printed slides for directors. Yes. Thank you so much. Good evening, Board Chair Guzman Ortiz, Board Members, Student Advisor, Superintendent Castaneda. I am very happy today to bring you some updates on our literacy instruction. And we are going to focus on a high overview today of literacy in second grade. I wanna start first by telling you why these matters to us. Uh, back in September, you all adopted some very clear goals for our district, and those goals included third grade reading. We already know that uh, third grade is an important uh, benchmark for us and that we need to have our students reading at grade level by third grade for them to um, uh, not to avoid some uh, risks of not graduating and other um, uh, things that may not helpful, uh, help uh, them be successful in future. Um, so for us, it is very important to look at second grade and see how they're doing before we get to that uh, third grade important, grade, important time. Um, uh, the other uh, reason why this is really important is because in second grade, students are making that transition between uh, breaking the code and learning to read to using reading to access information. Reading is a great equalizer. We believe that helping students learn how to read will support their development in so many areas. It opens a world of opportunities for them, and we want that for every single one of our students. Um, we uh, focus on helping students break the code, and when we talk about the code, is this man-made code of reading. We want them to know that, uh, and, and teach these very, very clearly and specifically, that um, there are sounds in our language and those sounds are represented by symbols that are called letters. Those letters put together make words, those words put together make sentences, and sentences uh, put together make stories that carry a lot of meaning and content and stories and things that we want them to um, learn about. Um, and then analyze and write about later in life. So um, our teachers focus from the very moment that we get our students, even in pre-K, our third, our three-year-olds, we start developing those skills that they bring with them already from home, and then we start um, helping them build on that background knowledge and that language that they have into uh, the foundations for reading. Um, in Salem Kaiser, you have heard these over and over again. We value background in bilingualism. We have over 110 languages spoken in our schools, and we know that students start learning to read at birth. They, the way they hear the parents' stories, the, the way they hear the sounds are all bases that are going to help them become great readers in their home language and then also in English. They will learn English because they have a strong base in their home language. So we use those gifts and those um, incredible skills that they bring with them from home to build upon and help them become great readers. And then uh, we monitor and intervene. At every grade level, we do benchmark assessments. Teachers are doing, doing running records that are like a teacher gets next to a student and listens to them read and takes notes on what are some of the 
um, uh, important things that they need to teach them to continue moving them along that uh, trajectory of reading. And, and they intervene. They um, use small group instruction, they connect with parents, they talk to other specialists in the building to make sure that students are developing as we want them to develop um, um, in all of the grade levels. So today, again, I'm gonna show you uh, some data. And first, before we uh, dig into the data, I wanna tell you about these. Um, uh, today, I'm gonna tell you about two assessments, ECCBM that you have in front of you and STAR. Um, ECCBM is the assessment that we have used for the past few years, and now we are transitioning uh, slowly to STAR, which is a, a way better assessment, and I'll tell you why while I present uh, the data to you. Um, in this uh, chart that you have in front of you, this is the English passage reading fluency. Again, second grade. We're all going to talk about second graders today. Uh, you see three colors there. And then the green is, this is a risk, um, um, a reading risk data chart. Um, the green means that students in that, um, in that column are, 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 are at very low risk of becoming, uh, of having any issues in becoming readers. They are developing as they should. They are maybe reading at, at above grade level. Uh, they're moving along in a way that we um, feel is very appropriate for their grade level. Uh, so you can see in fall of 2022, we had about 39% of students that in um, October when we do this assessment, uh, scored at a low risk level. And then in 2023, just last month, we have 45% of our second graders uh, that are reading just like we need them to be reading. Um, the yellow column are students that are at some risk. So these are students that may have one um, skill that is maybe keeping them a little bit behind. So the teacher is monitoring analyzing and supporting so that they can strengthen that skill and pretty quickly and usually students in this some category move to that green area to the low um, risk uh, area and so in fall of 2023 we have about 25 percent of our students in that area and then same as last year um, then the red area the red column is um, represents students that are at high risk that means that they may have a, a full year of development still to make, or they have two or three areas of risk, three important skills. Maybe they are not blending sounds correctly. Maybe they don't recognize all the letter um, names, letter sounds. And so teachers are really intentionally assessing them and instructing them in small groups, maybe a couple interventions a week, there's a lot of communication with families. We may have in this red column also some students that are newcomers that speak other languages than English and Spanish. And so they are just developing language. And that's why they need a little bit more time. Um, and we also have in these uh, red category students whose teachers are really um, watching for maybe additional evaluation that will lead us to support them with special education resources. So that's the, again, second grade um, English passage uh, reading fluency. Now let's go to Spanish data. So as you know, 47% of our students come with um, uh, backgrounds of families that speak uh, Spanish at home. And we are very excited to be able to offer now dual language instruction in 15 elementary schools and um, have biliteracy in 21 elementary schools. Um, so students come in and they continue learning based on the background and the language that they have at home, in this case, Spanish. I want to point out, um, I have underlined in here, this is the data for Spanish a sentence reading fluency. And if you can remember, the English was passage reading fluency. So this assessment is not as rigorous in, in English and in Spanish as we would want it to be. 
but it's what we had for many years. That is one of the reasons why we are moving to the STAR assessment that I'll tell you about in a little bit. So um, uh, our second graders in this one, let's take a look at this data. And last year, our uh, fall 22, our second graders came in in October and were at 45% um, of them were at low risk of, of not being good readers. Um, did I say that correctly? Low risk of, no. thank you. That sounded like a double negative, thank you. Um, then we had 27% that were at some risk and 29% that were at high risk. And then you'll see the numbers there to your right of this year, 42%, 25%, and 33%. So a little bit higher in the high risk category. And of course, teachers uh, continue paying attention to that. Again, this is sentence reading fluency in Spanish for Spanish scores. I'm going to stop here for a minute. I've given you a lot of information. And then before I go to start, I have um, questions also. I'll open up to questions at the end, but is there anything you want to ask me about these two charts and the ECCBM uh, assessment? Yes, Dr. Chandigiri. So if I understand right, these are second graders, but they are not the same cohort you are measuring, correct? You are correct. Okay. The, yes, the second graders to the left that were in uh, that, that that full data, they are now in third grade. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We just want to compare the cohorts and how students are showing up one year to the next. Is is there any indicators? I mean, assuming new arrivals potentially for having a higher. Oh. She stole Oops. my graph. <laughs> um, uh, the 33%, the, the high risk uh, compared to the previous year, the 29%. Mm -hmm. I don't have, I, I don't know that we would have um, so many that it would be um, a big difference in the percentage. I know that we have way more arrivers, I think 250 families last year, but I, I didn't count the, the numbers to give you that Is specific. It, it, and then with these students, with the sum and high, or even just the, along with the high, is there more individualized time with them? Well, you said there's a lot of parent communication. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. So when a student is, um, teachers do um, protocols, data protocols as grade levels, and they um, come back with what are the areas that students are needing more support in. And then students are placed in small groups. Those are led by the teacher in the classroom. And they are also placed in intervention groups. And those groups are specific to the skill that they need to move to the next level. Um, there's, um, uh, there are important skills when we're teaching reading that students need to learn to mastery. They, they can't move from one skill to the next. If they have a hole in the first skill, if they don't understand phonics, for example, they can't move to the next level. And so teachers are always making sure that they are solidifying those skills that need to be learned to mastery before they move them to another intervention groups. Interventions usually take six to eight weeks in schools. Teachers are constantly monitoring and making sure that students are making the movements that they need to make, the, the, the um, progression that they need to make. And if they're not, then they do a different intervention that goes deeper into the skill and they continue to monitor. If they don't, they do another intervention that goes deeper into the skill. And then if, if the student is not moving, then they engage other specialists in the building a reading specialist, a special educator. Um, they may do some more assessments. And, and through all of these, there's tons of communications with the families before we, of course, we assess a student um, with any of those specialized assessments. Thank you. Thank you. I, I had a question around, I guess, looking that it says reading risk levels. And as I was looking at the green, I think just been conditioned to think of green as um, fluent, perhaps, right, or like approved of. So in this graph, does the green, the low risk, does that equate proficiency or is, or not exactly? Yes, it, it means, um, we just talk about it as a risk level because um, the, the progression of reading keeps moving 
in the year and gets harder and harder as the months go. And so we just say the student hasn't really gotten to proficiency. They're just developing with very low risk. We are not worried that they're going to fall into risk because they're developing as they should. Um, but they haven't gotten there, they haven't gotten to proficiency yet. It means they're doing they're doing well. They're developing as they should as readers. Yep. Does that did I answer that? Yeah, that's helpful. And I wanted to cue uh, Director Nohos Pressy who had raised her hand. Uh, I did. Thank you very much. Um, I I feel like my question was answered because it was in a similar vein to Director Osvaldo, uh, to Director Avila, Osvaldo Avila. Um, but it was more based around like our dual language expansion. Um, but I feel like it's kind of like a similar response because my question was going to be, do we feel like the expansion of dual language might have set something uh, like a little bit of instability in some of our students of just kind of like wrapping around this change. Um, but I feel like it would be the same answer as like, well, we don't have the number <laughs> off the top of our heads kind of thing to know if it was impactful or not. Does that, does that make sense? I feel like I kind of went around in a circle just then. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I was actually hoping for a question like that when I talked about STAR. So let me move into STAR and tell you why this new assessment matters greatly for our expansion of dual language. Um, uh, so next slide, please. OK, so this is a, a STAR assessment. We are using it in all of the schools that are doing our dual language programming. The reason why we're using STAR is because they provide very rigorous assessment in English and in Spanish. If we are doing passage reading in English, we're doing passage reading in Spanish. It is not a translation. It is um, a passage, for example, that has been written by a, by a um, Spanish author. Uh, it has high academic language, just like the high academic language that we see in English. Both assessments uh, we hear from teachers are high quality. And then the, the program itself gives the teachers tons of information about that biliteracy development of the student. It tells us, here's how the student is developing in, the, let's say we have a student who's an English, an English uh, speaker at home and is learning Spanish as a second language. The assessment will be able to tell us this is how they're doing in English, this is how they're doing in Spanish, and this is what you can do instructionally to support both of those languages. Um, we haven't had that with, with ECCBM. It's just a STAR has been designed for multilingual learners. Um, so in here you can see this is a, a much smaller number of students than the other one because we only are using it in uh, the schools that are doing uh, dual language. Um, but we see similar trends, 44, and that's why you don't have data for last year, right? This is the very first year we're using STAR. 44% of our students are reading at grade level. 13% are in that SOM category that just need a couple skills to move. And then 43% are in the red, um, which is the high risk area. Again, um, we have played around and analyzed as a team the assessments. And we feel like there's more students in the red because this, the assessment on itself is way more rigorous than what we had in the past. Dr. Chandigarh. So I just have a generic question. So when you have this red uh, or in general when you see at what point in time ch students are kind of tested for any specific uh, learning disorder like uh, dyslexia, et cetera, so that that may be a factor. And if so, is that systematically done or does ESD do or some outside uh, providers do because all these kids have to be covered? Yes, we do screening for dyslexia in schools and there are lots of resources for our teachers when they start wondering about that. And usually we have an instructional mentor, a reading specialist that will support with those questions. And then again, um, if we are doing interventions and we are trying a few things that we have in our toolbox, 
and still the student is not making the progress that we expect, then we engage other professionals to do additional testing. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so if we go to the Spanish uh, uh, data, and um, Director Inojos Presi, I think this is um, uh, where I wanted to address your question. In the Spanish data, um, we have students who are now in their dual language, our, our first group of second graders in dual language. So in this Spanish data, you have students who are English speakers at home who are learning Spanish as a second language. And that is why we, we think we see that 48% in the high category. Remember, they are Spanish language learners, developing language. It will take them three to seven years to learn a second language. And so, um, but, but finally, we have an assessment that, um, that can help us move students from both um, uh, groups that are learning one or the other language. In this case, we have 41% of students that are at low risk. They're developing well as readers. 12% that need a little bit of a push and then we'll get them into that green category and then 48% students that are at this time not developing as we need them to, so we're doing lots of targeted interventions with them. Okay, and then I have one more slide. Um, um, so what do we do with all of these data? What does that mean for schools? I am uh, giving you just a very high level overview, but at schools, teachers do these benchmark assessments three times per year. They come together in grade level teams with their principal, reading specialist, instructional mentor, uh, people from the curriculum department, and they analyze the data to the student level to make sure that they are um, um, really understanding what's happening with all of the learning learners at that grade level. They can make plans for interventions. They can make plans for small groups instruction. They can make plans to make phone calls to parents and engage them in the uh, problem solving. Um, and then they monitor, monitor, monitor until the, net, the next uh, benchmark assessment comes back in January. And we see growth in the system. We see growth in how students are doing. And then by spring, uh, when we do our last benchmark assessment, we, of course, always see a lot of growth. And if there, uh, there is not, no growth, again, um, we have uh, already intervened in different levels to support the students. Um, something that is coming up in December um, that we will bring to you and, and, and that we already introduced last year for some of you that were here with us last year is the early literacy framework from uh, the state of Oregon. And this is a requirement for districts to uh, focus and pay attention on the efforts of early literacy. Again, with the goal of having kids be readers by third grade, we are putting a lot of emphasis in um, elevating the importance of language, uh, recognizing that literacy begins at birth and that parents are the first and most important teachers of literacy of our students. So partnering with families is going to be one of the fundamental pieces, uh, components of our plan. Um, we also um, know that we need to teach students those foundational skills. As I was telling you, there are some skills that students need to learn to mastery. They will not be able to move on as good readers if we leave holes in those skills. And so we need to train our teachers really well to make sure that they know how to teach those and that they know how to assess them and they know how to respond to the needs of the students as they demonstrate that they have uh, needs in those areas. Um, and then um, uh, the, the grant will also support a lot of teacher development and professional development. Um, we have had a couple of experiences with our teachers in the past summer where we went back and taught um, literacy skills and how to teach literacy, the art of teaching literacy in both English and Spanish and teachers, uh, feedback was incredible. So we are also really hopeful for uh, this grant and what this will um, uh, provide for our district. In December, we will come back to you with the actual proposal that we are planning to uh, submit to the state. 
and hope for your approval and then feedback if we need to make any changes. And then we are hoping to start with those plans. Um, we could start as early as this year and also um, uh, in the fall of 24. Do you have any questions? Student advisor, um, this might be a silly question, but uh, I noticed in the star graphs that there's a um, small percentage of students in the sm uh, sum risk. Um, what are we doing to ensure that those students aren't kind of getting forgotten about because the high risk is so high? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a great question. And um, again, it's looking at the student individual um, uh, level to make sure that teachers understand what is the one thing, because they're so close. Usually students in that yellow category move quickly to green, but we need to understand what is it that's keeping them from reading at grade level. Um, and that is the, the conversation that happens in those uh, grade level teams. And that is also what principals monitor very closely in partnership with instructional mentors or reading specialists at schools. Thank you, uh, Director Richardson. Thank you. Thank you for all of that great information. My question is, what trainings are we providing the parents? Mm -hmm. The Coalition for Equality did this years ago, and we saw the benefits of that. Mm -hmm. So I want to know what type of trainings are we planning for our parents, because they can help their students as well. Yes, yes, and when they have and when they know how and when we have that partnership with parents, we have seen kids grow incredibly. So the early literacy framework actually has as a requirement that there is a parent educational component. So next uh, month, when we bring you back our plan, you will see that we built into the plan six week sessions for parent education, where we are hoping to bring parents into elementary schools and tell them about those skills, remember, uh, that I tell you need to be uh, taught to mastery. We're gonna help parents understand what are some key strategies um, that they can practice at home, starting with just the love of reading, just reading a book and helping a kid learn to love a story is in, it's so powerful. When kids like to read, when kids uh, see people that they love reading to them, then they're hooked and then we take care of the code and then they're, they become successful readers. So thank you for that question. We are, uh, we'll share with you more of our plans, but uh, that is an important component that we're paying attention with this early literacy grant. Thank you. Uh, Director Chandragiri. Thank you, Chair. Uh, is there, do you envision a role for volunteers to come to school now that we are post whatever storm, perfect storm we all went through, COVID pandemic, so that they can also be of additional help in, uh, for those who maybe parents may not be able to or for whatever reason? Mm -hmm. Yes, always. We always um, appreciate having the help of volunteers. We have long-standing um, programs in our schools. I'm thinking of Reading Buddies, for example, mm -hmm. at Highland Elementary, where on Thursday mornings, we have a group of uh, community members that read to students. And sometimes there are students that are in that red category that just need to learn to fall in love with reading. And so there's a community member who comes in and they uh, are all meeting in the cafeteria, they read a book, they talk about what they read, and then the student gets back to classroom after those 25 minutes. So yes, um, we appreciate the help of volunteers and we have many ways in which they can participate in this um, um, new effort. So the uh, some way if we can communicate to the community because they think certain policies perhaps may be limiting volunteers if there is how to sign up for volunteers in different schools, how they can be of help. That would be appreciated because for, you know, it's a change. A uh, lot of things are can be put back in place. So community members are will appreciate. They've approached me, how can we volunteer? So it would be helpful. Okay. Thank you. I see Director Inohospressi, your hands up. 
this is kind of just like a, a selfish question um, because I do have a kid that's uh, trying to learn both English and Spanish at the same time. And um, sometimes it's kind of hard to access uh, Spanish language books, although I do really appreciate the ones that the local library has, like mm -hmm. both like the city of Salem and um, my local school. Sometimes even there's like words that I struggle to pronounce <laughs> and Spanish is my first language. Um, but um, how do we feel about people being able to read to their students like an English based book, but kind of like translating it on the fly? The, I, I think it's great. I think you're, um, again, motivating and encouraging your student to listen to stories <clears throat> and to understand that there's meaning behind those stories, that text, um, uh, to comprehend what that text is trying to communicate to them. Um, so we, we support any of, of that. Um, we do encourage if students are in a dual language classroom that they try to access that language as much as as much as possible in outside the school if if that is easy for the family and then something else that i'll mention here is that uh, regarding books and curriculum um, we will engage in a curriculum a curriculum adoption for elementary in 2025 and our, one of our goals will be to have materials that are um, authentic, that are written by authors that are high in academic language, that are um, uh, made for bilingual and multicultural learners, um, and that recognize the culture and the values that students bring with them. So um, we're also looking forward to that, um, to give families and students access to better, to better books. Oh, no, yeah, no, definitely. Like there's, like I said, sometimes there's books that I struggle with the words because I'm like, okay, this is to another level of uh, Spanish, like academic language that we're teaching our kids. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, just a clarifying question. When you were talking about the grants on the early literacy, I'm assuming that these are the early literacy district grants. These this is the the early literacy framework HB 30 3188 80. yes yes okay <laughs> I forget I, then all the numbers but no. yes okay thank you I just I, that was my assumption but I wanted to clarify um well thank you so much deputy superintendent we'll come oh we have one more question yes Thank you so much, honestly, all of you. And thank you, Olga. That was a good uh, presentation. Thanks for the length and the slides. Um, I just want to drop a couple things in. I know uh, one hot uh, question that we often get, which um, I was wondering, along with, again, that grant, early literacy, I understand that we're talking about bringing up reading levels, but an often the uh, question that we get is, what about the other end? Um, as I'm, I'm honestly not sure myself if we have TAG in, in our district right now or not. I know we still have a couple mm -hmm. teachers that, that are TAG, but I understood that we removed it. So I'm curious about where we are with that. So if we don't have it, what kind of structure is currently in place? And are we in an interim, like are planning on progressing back towards that to accommodate both ends of the spectrum, especially if we do have a specific focus on this now and with grant. Um, and then of course, volunteers. I've witnessed it with my own eyes and I like it. Uh, it's nice when teachers understand, I think too, if they kind of have that, that backup, if there's a trusted volunteer at the school that they can kind of have, um, out maybe in a pod with extra reading sessions, whichever. So I'd like that Highland Elementary idea and I hope it can, can grow and get back to kind of where we were and beyond uh, before the pandemic with, with again, all that, that extra help and all hands on deck. So mm -hmm. I hope yes. it can, thanks. Okay, yes, so uh, uh, thank you for the questions. We I have, uh, and you reminded me of important information that I wanted to share related to your question. Number one, yes, we do have the TAG program still. Students are assessed in second grade and then they enter into TAG programming. Teachers prepare a plan that is communicated with parents and that is monitored and reported on um, uh, in, a, in a yearly basis. 
there are many uh, opportunities we're looking into right now of additional supports to send to schools to help students, uh, to help teachers with those expansion opportunities for uh, students who are TAG. Um, another thing that is a benefit of this new assessment is that it has a computer adaptive assessment that helps us know exactly at what how students are performing related to the standards of reading in that grade level. It has great correlation with the state assessment. And what we have heard from teachers is that, is that it gives them a little more information about them, about kids as whole readers um, uh, in that grade level. So it's not just about the, the skills, the, those um, skills that they need to build upon reading, is more information about who they are as readers, who they are as, um, as people that can access content and comprehend text. Um, and I think that will be another key factor for us to be able to get to know our learners who are performing really highly um, so that we can continue pushing them to their potential. Good, thank you. So maybe capturing that gap where maybe some of the kids don't have to be tested in TAG and can still be accommodated because we want to bring up our graduation level and, but we also want quality <laughs> for the kids, which we understand has, has dropped as well. So that's good. I'd be really interested in checking that little uh, test out that how that works and, and seeing it. So you can add it to my list. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We'll learn together because we're all learning start together this Thank year. You. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again, um, Deputy Superintendent Cobb. And thanks, board, for your engagement and questions. We'll transition now, um, move us right along to item B, on, B and C, I'd say, on under readings and discussions. This item is for yours to review and the resolution specifically under item B will come back before the board for action at the December 12th meeting. At the same meeting, we'll vote um, at this, which will be the same board meeting. We vote on members to the OSBA board of directors and legislative policy committee. So the resolutions and candidate materials can be found on your packets. Um, including OSBA election information on the website. And I just kind of wanted to ask if Director Carson Cunningham, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to raise. I recognize that you are on the OSBA Board of Directors. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to the board to review the, the ballot, it's a little bit confusing. You should have gotten an email with all the candidates. Um, and you know, there's two positions in the Marion region um, I am running for position 11, and then Maria is running for the Legislative Policy Committee for position 11 for that, and then Osvaldo is running for position 12 for the Legislative Policy Committee. So just take a look. Um, everyone put their materials forth. It's confusing because you can't just vote your ballot online. You ac we actually have to vote as a group, and then one person submits it online. So that's the only confusing part. And then the bylaws changes and everything are in your packet. So if you have any questions on um, any of the background for those changes in the bylaws and the resolution, just let me know offline. Thank you so much. Thanks for taking that on. Um, so this is just informational. And we'll transition right into item nine on the agenda, which is information and standard reports. These are in written form. but. Just as a reminder, everything that's in this is provided for the boards to review ahead of the meeting. And then we'll actually queue here, Director of Strategic Initiatives, Dr. Susan West, to provide a quick overview of the 2223 Student Investment Account Annual Report. And thank you. Thank you, Chair Guzman Ortiz, Directors, Student Advisor. Nice to see you all tonight, Superintendent. Um, I will be brief. This is a report that we bring to you annually. Those of you who have been on the board for a while are familiar with the structure of this report. Um, we present to you every year just a few highlights of how we have utilized our SIA funds from the previous year, as well as how we are intending to use those funds for the upcoming year. A third component of this report 
is information around the annual audit. Um, do want to start off by saying that our annual audit is this close to being complete. And so far, there have been no findings specific to use of SIA funds. So we're in pretty good shape there. To recap school year 22-23, I just want to share with you a few highlights about how we utilized our resources specific to the student investment account. Um, we used these monies in a few different um, strategic areas. You may have heard in previous reports that we utilize quite a bit of these funds to promote the idea of sense of belonging in a couple of different ways. Um, one of the ways that we promoted sense of belonging in our schools is through an infusion of resources towards extracurricular activities. We know that when students feel connected to their school community and they often feel connected through extracurricular activities towards finding their thing, that they are more likely to remain engaged in school and actually see their schooling all the way through graduation. So what that looks like for us, for example, we've been able to expand middle school athletics. We've been able to offer clubs and activities after school at the, at the middle school level. We've been able to do the same thing at the high school level. We've been able to infuse resources into our music programs, um, into our theater programs. And the utilization of those resources has allowed more kids to access the program, more young people, um, and to sustain those programs in a way that simply charging fees to students and utilizing the school general fund resources cannot do. so. Student investment account has been a tremendous boon in that area for us. Another way connected to sense of belonging that we have utilized those resources is towards the hiring of staff and um, bringing in additional supports to students that need mental health or therapy, for example. We've been able to provide that directly in all of our school environments. We've been able to increase the number of social workers that we have, the number of counselors that we have available to students. And all of these resources provide students with the foundations that they need to feel safe, welcome, have their basic needs met so that they can continue to access their education on a daily basis. Two other ways I'll quickly highlight from the last year that we've utilized SIA resources. Um, one of those ways you just heard a tremendous about, uh, amount about from my colleague here, Deputy Superintendent Cobb. Um, we've used many of our resources towards dual language expansion and ensuring that students have high quality resources that they can access in their classroom as they are learning in two languages. And also that the staff who are supporting students in that language development have the training and the skills that they need to do so well. And then lastly, we've focused many of our resources on ninth grade on track. And ninth grade on track is one of those metrics that we saw improve from the 22-23 school year. We had a 3.7% um, basis point improvement. Um, so we're excited to see that the resources and the strategies that we employed towards ninth grade on track have actually started to pan out. For the coming year, I uh, want to remind you that SIA is now part of our overall integrated plan. So it is one part of a larger plan that includes several different grants. The early literacy grant will be incorporated into that integrated plan as well. For the coming year, there are several areas that we will focus on. We will certainly continue to focus on dual language, social, emotional, behavioral, mental health support. We will also continue our community engagement efforts. Um, we meet regularly with the community to share how we're utilizing our strategic investment account to solicit feedback about the results that we're seeing through that strategic investment and to use that feedback to guide our decisions about how to continue to utilize monies. Just for some context um, specific to the student investment account, a significant portion of the monies that we spend are devoted to staff. We have about 186 staff that we are paying through the student investment account. Most of those staff are supporting our social emotional behavioral health strategy in a variety of ways, some of which I've mentioned tonight. Um, more than half of our resources go towards that strategy. Um, so it's a strategy that we feel very strongly about. The board just recently selected sense of belonging as one of the five 
um, really important priorities for the district because of how foundational it is to student success and student learning. Um, so we're excited that the board is interested in that because it allows us to continue to focus on those things that have yielded for us emergent outcomes for students that show that those strategic investments actually help our young people do better in schools. What questions can I answer for you? If we want to see like line items uh, on the budget directly being spent, these funds being spent in these areas, where could I reference that or would you be able to share? Yeah, we actually post our budget online, so I'd be happy to share a link with the school board so that you can review that at your leisure. I'd be happy to spend some time with you as well going through those line items. Um, if you remember when we brought the budget to you to approve for this upcoming school year, the one that we're in right now, um, the budget is very complex and it's function and object based. So that can be difficult to interpret, but it is online for you to take a look at. Thank you. Thank you, that was my question. So I would be interested in digging deeper still in that as well. And thanks for the link. <laughs> Director Trenergy. Thank you, Dr. West. Can we have uh, some kind of uh, little outline that we can use when we meet different communities so that we can explain? You know, SIA was like a big deal. It's a huge uh, game changer in our public education in our state. And so it would really be helpful if there is some kind of slide set that I can have when I meet different communities, I can try to use that as a way to explain and to show why we are doing what you're doing in times like this and uh, elsewhere also. Some of which may not be in other language, but I can help my community understand. Odie, you might have some resources available and might have some of those translated, I would just say, since they're leading some of this SIA, but I don't know if Dr. West has additional. Words out of my mouth. Um, the Department of Education has a wonderful graphic that I will include in the email that is sent to all of you with the link to our budget. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Dr. West. And I'm just gonna keep us moving along. Um, we act, the, the other item under the information and standard reports is actually a financial update for the quarter that ended on September 30th. And I just wanted to cue Superintendent Castaneda for a verbal update on this. Yes, thank you so much. Um, we have a, a large viewing audience um, tonight. Um, maybe at home, a larger viewing audience, but for now, Alan and Julie and the board, uh, this one's for you. Um, so this is actually the first of what I believe need to become quarterly um, detailed reports about our district's financial situation. It is now I think widely understood that we do have some challenges to overcome and it should be the expectation of the community and the board that as we manage our budget on a quarter by quarter basis, you all can see progress in the work that we're putting forth. Tonight will be the first of those quarterly updates. And it does also, um, it feels really good to say that we have some good news for the community tonight in this quarterly update. I am going to spend some time on this and I just wanna prepare everyone for that, although I know it's late. Um, this is a really important topic that has a bearing on many other things that are gonna happen next. And I wanna make sure that we've covered it with care and in detail. Um, so if you could actually advance to the first slide. Uh, we're gonna keep using this chart to um, tell the story of our budget. It is um, a simplified chart, but it is a true story. And it is the clearest way to track our progress towards financial health. This is the one that we've been looking at since about July. We introduced this to um, the board, I believe, um, in an updated form, even maybe it was even my second board meeting when we discussed the budget. And I wanna clarify and confirm a few things about this chart. First, this was done before we started spending for this fiscal year. 
We're going to look at an update soon, but this is where we started. This does include the funding from the, from the final funding from the biennium. There was some confusion earlier tonight about whether it includes the full amount. The full amount is split over two biennial years. And this represents fully the entire portion for this year of the biennium. The next approximately 10 million will show up in next year's chart. So that is an important clarification. There was also some confusion earlier tonight that I want to address about the inclusion of ESSER. We have included $23 million in ESSER related expenses in the 24-25 year. Those are reoccurring expenses and those are people or services often in schools. There are no one-time expenses in that 23 million. There are no roofs, there are no computers. Those are reoccurring expenses and they're represented here because we are gonna have to figure out what to do about them. So those are some quick clarifications. I also want to remind you of a few other things about this. Although this represents only the gen fund, the story that this chart tells holds across our other funding sources. This is our largest and our most important. As we start to change the shape of this story, we will be changing the shape of our other funding stories as well. Can you please advance to the next slide? Okay, this moves us towards what begins to be the start of a good news story. So the chart on the left is the one we just looked at in a larger form. That was our, the beginning of this fiscal year's projection. We all know it well, it has that negative $38 million ending fund balance. Um, and you can see that it also has a $642 million projected expense line. I'd like you to look now just by shape at the chart on the right. <clears throat> the chart on the right shows the excellent effects of the hard work that's been done in our district in one quarter of resetting and closely managing our expenses. And for now, just look at the shapes and the things that you will notice. First, our ending fund balance is not falling as fast. That's because we're carefully managing and controlling expenses. A second thing about the shape that I'd like you to notice is that the negative ending fund balance has moved from a negative 38 to a negative 17. Now I hesitate to call any negative ending fund balance good news, but we do want to see that number getting smaller. And a final thing I just wanna show you about this is that we're starting to see the orange and the blue lines. The orange is our expense line and the blue is our revenue come just a little bit closer together. We also need that to be true. I wanna clarify something important about this. As a school district, we did not save tens of millions of dollars in one quarter. That is not the story that this is telling. The story that this is telling is that we reset our spending habits. And if we hold these new spending habits, over the course of two years, this is the end effect of it. And just one more time for clarity, say that. We are not claiming we saved tens of millions of dollars in one quarter. We're behaving differently and those new behaviors are having a positive impact on the financial health of our district. This is what we want to see. And this happened through a lot of hard work. I'm going to take the time to slice these two comparative graphs up and we're going to look at them in three different views. Um, so if you could please go to the next graph. Okay, this is just the first half of that graph side by side. Can, can I ask a question? Yes, please. So can you go back a slide? Mm -hmm. Unless, do you want us to wait till the very end to ask? No, please. Okay. When you said um, that the revenues from the state school fund will go up by 10 million, 
are you saying the blue line in the 2024-25 column when we enter in and we know we're getting that money will be 563 at that point? No, that that projection includes the additional biennial money. So oh, I thought you said it did not because no, um, we were getting an additional 10. Okay. I think so. I was a little unclear there. When when uh, we had an er earlier moment of confusion that claimed that um, we were getting 20 million, but we were only reporting 10. Your written quarterly port report is what that was referencing, and it references this fiscal year's additional biennial money. The total of the two spread across two years is reflected in this chart. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, this is an easy one. We can move quickly through this little sliced up comparison because this is the rear view mirror. Very little changes based on new spending patterns. This data is already locked in. Nothing about 2021 changes, and you can only see minor changes even in 22, 23 because we are just finalizing expenditure data. Nothing that happens next is gonna change these backward looking years. But let's look at this year. If you could, okay. Just this year's slice, I would love to spend a minute on. Um, first, what you can see here, and especially on that chart on the right, is that we have reduced our projected expenses by the end of this fiscal year by $28 million. That is against an approved budget and against budget assumptions that we are now outperforming because of the incredible amount of care that is going to every dollar that's going out the door. This is the best and frankly, the least painful way to close our gap, managing our day-to-day -day expenses. And we need to keep doing this just as aggressively as we currently are. You can also see that it reduced the revenue expense gap. So in the earlier version, the first version we looked at, we were talking about a nearly $60 million difference between the amount of money we were bringing in and the amount we were spending in the general fund. We have, with this level of spending care, dropped that down to 31 for this year. This is excellent news. It is not everything, but what this shows is an incredible attention to fiscal stewardship. Okay, let's look at next year. Uh, can you go back actually? Okay, here. On the left, you'll see again the chart we started with. This has the now somewhat famous negative $38 million ending fund balance. If we persist in these careful spending habits, we can bring that up to a negative 17. This is without cutting a single program, laying off a single person, without any other action. You can also see that we keep driving our expense line down. It falls another 16 million here against our original projections. All of this is the most important, easy, but still hard work to do. Now in the midst of this good news, I would like to pause and talk about something that is a little bit more difficult. First of all, a negative ending fund balance is an impossibility. We've been talking about negative 38 because it is as good a way as any to enter this conversation. But what has always been true in these charts from the first moment we showed them is that it's not the negative ending fund balance. It's the fact that we're spending more than we're bringing in that is the problem to solve. The ending fund balance is merely the symptom of the overspending. It is the overspending itself that we must address to reach sustainability. And so what I would like to call our attention to 
is the $73 million revenue expense gap that we're still projecting for next year. That's the mountain to climb. And we will. We are already on our way, only one quarter in, without a single cut to our system. We are already on our way. But that challenge, that 73, is still hanging out there for our attention. Yes, please. Okay, I have two questions. When, um, I mean, one, I'd like to talk about how you're able to do that because it's not easy and I want the public to understand what actions specifically are being taken that have changed this trajectory in the last six months. Um, what it, cause it does have an impact in mm -hmm. schools and classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanna make one small but important technical clarification. The data that we're looking right now is through quarter one. So July, August, September. So although we're a little bit further in the calendar year, this still only reflects the first quarter spending changes. The biggest thing that we've done here, remember we are 87% people. The biggest thing we've done is closely manage vacancies. Critical school-based vacancies are the vacancies we're still hiring. Critical staffing vacancies, the ones we're still filling. And as we closely manage those vacancies, we end up achieving savings at this level. It is the, it is the power of a big budget that's mostly people too. Now you are right, there are implications for schools in this. Because what this also means is that we've been much more careful about warding additional positions into schools and really trying to monitor ratio. So it is not painless, but it is also an action we can take that does not require us to reduce staff. It is the most important first step short of that. The majority of what we see here is managing vacancies at that level of diligence. Thank you. I think it's just important to point out um, that I think the vast majority of the public don't understand the full concept of vacancy savings um, in a huge budget like this. It's basically if you have someone quit or retire, resign, get sick, you're not filling that position unless it's a critical position deemed by the district. It just, it does then make your team smaller, right? It puts more pressure on other people. And so it is a, an impact that the district has been hesitant up to the point, you know, of coming out of the pandemic. We wanted to fill those vacancies, no matter what they were, as quickly as possible to help kids. And so now we're cutting back on that to try to land coming out of the pandemic a little, you know, a little better. It's not gonna, it's gonna be very hard, but it's just, I don't want the public to think like we all of a sudden made a decision and then it was so easy to save all this money. <laughs> it's it, not, it's extremely painful still. Yes, I appreciate you saying that. And I also just wanna use that to emphasize, we have not already saved this much. We will have to adhere to this level of spending for two fiscal years to get to this level of savings. But it resets the trajectory in a way that is very promising and yet still hard earned. Mm -hmm. I had a second question, but I don't want to take up all the space. So, you do. I have also other questions. Go ahead, and you have a question, Chrissy. No, I want you to ask your questions. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Sorry. Director Shondiger. So, this is a. I mean, I'm trying to make sense out of this, and it kind of. I know it's hard. To leave a position and not fill it. But moving forward, if we is there a I mean, eventually, would there be like a way to get our targeted end fund balance to between, say, seven and twelve percent of our total revenue? Mm -hmm. Because that's 
you know, it kind of gives us a little bit of a cushion and also aligns with the policies. Um, can I actually ask um, whoever's controlling the deck to go forward at least one? Okay. This is a mock-up of a point in the future that when we achieve it, um, it will feel hard and the path here will have been hard. It is, as much as anything, a good way to answer your question because you can see here that if we were to get to the point where we have made that expense and revenue line touch, you can see that our ending fund balance has jumped back up into policy range. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I think that this is actually even probably right in the middle approximately mm -hmm. of the policy range for our ending fund balance. Okay. Um, so that's, you can just kind of imagine how those lines keep interacting with each other every time we touch them. Do you mind if I kind of, I mean, I think in some of our previous conversation, we discussed why it is important, because people may wonder. So it's really important uh, because eventually when we go to ask for a bond or some raise money, it kind of keeps the, in, you know, the interest rate less, as less as possible. That's my understanding. Perhaps if you can correct me if I'm wrong, it puts less pressure on the taxpayers on the downstream. There are a number of really important elements associated with strong financial health. Bond rating is one of them, and it does consider, as a matter of financial health, the adequacy of your reserves. In effect, our ending fund balance. Thanks. So yes, absolutely true. I'll, I'll let you continue, but I, I heard, I think just the statement of the path here will be hard. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some slides that outline a little bit more of what that means. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are. Okay. Are there other? I had my other question, mm -hmm. but oh, okay. is that okay? Yeah, go for it, Ashley. Thanks. Sorry. Chair? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So can we go back to the slide we were on? So of the $73 million revenue expense gap, do we know how much of that is due to the federal pandemic funding going away? 23 million of reoccurring expenses is pressed into that number. Say, so, say that again. So of that, of that 73, 23 million is our reoccurring expenses that are currently on ESSER, but as of October of next year, no longer can be. And most, and mostly staff positions. Um, it is mostly yes. It is mostly staff um, and other kinds of products and services in schools. And we okay. we could provide you a breakdown. I don't have that handy. Yes. No. I just I think it's important because there's I think with the conversation going on everywhere, schools are dealing with the loss of federal funding. People, all the schools used it in different ways. We used it to meet the most critical needs, and I just want to be clear that we want to continue those positions, but the federal funding is not there to support that. Mm -hmm. So while other districts may have started laying off positions a long time ago um, that were federally funded or given notice even before this calendar year, our district made the choice to keep those positions going forward because of the dire need. So it just makes our it, revenue expense gap larger, it doesn't mean that it's not a problem. It mm -hmm. just means it's a problem we need to solve. But part of, there's a reason for the, t at least a portion of the 73 million. Uh, a sizable portion of right. the 73 million. Yeah, Director Hudson. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, just really quick, uh, I, I don't know if we're gonna get into this with the other slides or not, uh, but about um, when we may be talking about uh, anticipated trajectory coming out of this when we see a norm. I don't know if we're kind of reevaluating and glancing at that with everything else as we go. Um, and what I mean by that is if at each level, if we have a vague understanding of how many years it ideally would take for us to get out of this based on the knowledge that we have as of today. Does that make sense? So we're not, so we're on this two year uh, tightening of the belt, for example. Um, when, as, as one little piece, when we might see that loosen up a little bit, 
have, have we, can do we, we have any anticipation of, of that? We're, can we go back to the, oh, can we go forward to the next graph? I'm gonna see if I understood your question correctly. Um, although this chart ends in June of 2025, we actually have about four months to make these cuts. We, we don't unfortunately have years because when you all begin your budget work, when the budget committee begins their budget work this spring, they will need to approve a balanced budget for next year. And unless it looks more or less like this, it will not be a balanced budget. And so that is why on various, in various moments, you've heard uh, our team talk about the urgency of doing this well but doing it quickly. It's because in the spring, we need to be able to present a balanced budget. And that means that more or less that orange and blue line need to touch. Now, I think your question is, can we imagine projecting forward to where things will start to feel a little looser? Like we won't have to be managing this budget with such intensity. Is that right? Correct. That's hard to project because we'll be into the new state biennium. Um, but that is where very much the advocacy that uh, we have been talking about in our community conversations, our colleagues across the state have been talking about, needs to show up. Um, and I think it's probably um, a little bit early for me or anyone to project any changes in the new biennium, positive or negative. I. Um I appreciate the reiteration too with the timeline line of the severity of the four months, the, the, the reason behind that and why, so that ideally we can set ourselves up for success more as early as next year, looking at realistically what, what each school needs to function, mm -hmm. necessities, rather than lingering the process mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and not getting to that end point. <laughs> Uh, even longer or indefinitely, so thank you. Thank you, directors. I'm gonna hand it back to Superintendent Castellana to get us through this portion. I'm just gonna be yep. out of time. Um, can you advance to the next slide, please? So then zooming back out, kind of at the balcony level, again, just looking at shapes. The top left is where we started. The middle is after one quarter of significant changes in spending habits. And that one in the right, more or less, is where we need to be in May. I wanna share one hard thing about this. No matter what moment we were in as a community, whether we were bargaining or whether we were not, we would be in front of you with this message regardless of what happens in bargaining, we are facing the loss of hundreds of people from our system who are currently working for us and on July 1st will not be. If there was any way to avert that or make it less true, we would have already done it. And if there was any way for me to soften that language and still be honest, we would have softened it. But we're at a point now where the courage comes in facing the reality of this together and carving a path together. Debating the accuracy, the fundamental accuracy of these shapes is, I fear, not the best use of our time when we have such important work to do together. Now we must come together and decide to tackle this challenge in the very best way that we can. The community conversations were the very start of that. If we can go to the next slide um, and then just advance one more. 
Okay, so what I would like to do is project for you the next steps. Um, we have been following the chart that we laid out for you all and for the public quite religiously. We are now done with box number two, which is the community conversations. And the next thing that will happen is on December 12th. That is our next business meeting as a board. And at that meeting, we are gonna bring you an updated version of this graph in addition to a recommendation for millions of dollars in reductions to district level services. This first round of reductions protects the experience of students in schools. And they will be the largest reductions of district level services in over a decade. Our team has spent weeks going through every single line of this budget. And for each one, we literally ask ourselves this, the question, is this expense more important than a person who's serving students in the building? Every single line of the entire district budget has been exposed to that question. And we are going to bring a thoughtful and significant package. When we do it, we're gonna reset this graph and we're gonna see another positive change as we progress from the top left down to our desired end state. And we are still not gonna close the gap. But at that point, we will have made a very significant contribution without impacting the experience of students in schools. It will still impact schools, but it will not impact the experience of students in schools. That is the first round. After we deliver that in a month, and after we see the reset of the chart, we'll have another clearer view of what size of a gap exists, but it will still be incomplete because of bargaining. When I first arrived, I said the bargaining outcome is the single largest driver and the single most unknowable variable, and that remains true. Nonetheless, we'll continue progressing in all of the ways we can and should to address the gap because we don't have to wait for the end of bargaining to know that we have a sizable challenge to resolve. I will close this portion by saying one personal item. I am 137 days on this job and I'm grateful every day for it. The difficulty of this message needs to be crystal clear and the, the certainty of it is the underlying um, mission of my work right now. To be anything other than frank is a disservice to this community and it would be an abdication of leadership on my part. I would rather bring this message along with hope and confidence about the way we're going to address it than hide from it and expose us to even greater risk later. This is how I serve. I'll turn it back to you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Castaneda. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to thank you for the comprehensive information and the visuals, I think, to help us adult learners lean into this information and, and grasp it. And also just to be able to share with our community, um, we can see and hear the intention of you and the team in really working and guiding us to a balanced budget and understanding how important that is. Um, we know also that you are doing this amid supporting schools, amid bargaining, and preparing for a possible strike based on what we see across the, happening across the state. And 
just want to express my gratitude for your courageous leadership and for the transparency and timeliness and communication. Um, the road is rough. The road is rough, but I am confident that we will get there together. Thank you. I can feel the room. Thank you all for just leading with your hearts through this as well. We have about 20 minutes remaining and um, we'll kind of just allow board members to share um, comments or just uh, share backs from formal committee assignments or activities of the board related to youth programs as well. Um, we could take no more than two minutes, that would be appreciated. Anyone who would like to get us started? Director Chandragiri. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Superintendent, uh, for, you know, this honest, transparent uh, sharing of this difficult but necessary message so that in the short run it'll be difficult but it'll allow us to grow and process and see how we can all have a shared narrative of our public school and that's i saw that in the three schools i attended the community conversation the first one it didn't sink in and by the time i went to the third one it really started sinking in and i could sense the you know anxiety and concern but people were also willing to participate close to thousand families showed up so i really appreciate this opportunity for me to listen authentically with our community teachers students and some of them are teachers who taught my children uh, you know so it was important for me you know the second piece I want to share is this morning, along with Dr. West, I visited the CTEC program in the behavioral health and human services. For me, you know, it's so nice to see this is the first year and 55 students who are getting ready to meet the needs of the workforce and they are all kind of eager. Why it's important? Because for me, this is like a dream come true for seeing young students who are eager to enter this field. You know, your eyes can't see what your mind doesn't know, and and this is so rewarding to see the education focusing on health issue skills. And growing up as a 12-year-old child in India, we did not recognize the signs and symptoms of schizophrenia in my own mother. It took nearly two more decades with, with a lot of toll on our family before she got the first treatment. And I wish I had learned about mental health issues sooner. It would have been helpful for me to understand my own mother better and get her the needed help. And these students are going to make a difference. They're going to make a difference. And I'm so glad and uh, I wish we can scale it up to the entire state where we start these pipelines sooner and, uh, uh, and create the workforce because it's a, mental health issues are like a pandemic proportion and children, mental health especially, is kind of so difficult. And to bring diverse communities and close the equity gap is what I see this future, 55 of them. So I was sharing that little anecdote with Dr. West as we're getting out. So I really appreciate you taking time and the principal and the staff taking time and uh, and allowing me to experience this. I never imagined in my lifetime I'll get to see this, and it's nice. Thank you. Thank you, Director. You want to pass? pass thank you. <laughs> I don't know how I could go for I just want to thank everybody for all of the information that we've received here this evening. I know we're still uh, doing great things, even though we have all of these obstacles and challenges. I truly believe that we will come to a solution in the best interest of everybody. We just have to continue to work hard,
trust, be transparent, and know that we don't have all of the answers. And this is not only happening in Salem-Kaiser School District. It's happening across the nation. And people do not have the answers right now. But I am convinced that this district will work together and we will have the answers that we need or we'll continue working hard to have the necessary solutions so that we don't have to hear our staff like we heard them tonight and that uh, students and parents will know that they have the supports that they need. Thank you. Um, I just want to use my time to give a shout out to our education support professionals. I know there's a um, proclamation in our in our consent agenda, but um, as I was thinking about what I've been doing, we've all been doing these community listening sessions. Um, I, you know, was just blown away by how many staff were there to help. Um, guide the community in and stay really late into the night to clean up after everyone that had been there um, feeding us and um, arranging the room how we wanted. And so, um, you know, in our proclamation, we want to give a huge shout out to the people that manage the, the school offices, provide custodial and maintenance, prepare, prepare healthy meals every day for our students, provide health and student services, keep our schools safe, drive our buses, and support students in classrooms as instructional assistants. We see you, we care deeply about you, and we thank you for your work. Thank you for that. Um, I, I mentioned earlier I had attended one of the Native Education um, events, and it was just a pleasure to be there uh, Get to listen to some some music and just some beautiful words, um, delicious tamales, <laughs> and of course having attend the community conversations. Just the opportunity to sit around, uh, kind of have the opportunity to jump tables to grasp bits and pieces. I wanted to just get an opportunity to hear more voices and connect with educators who were also there. Um, and then just lastly, I know that we also recently wrapped up uh, parent-teacher conferences and I got to attend as a parent and recognize that some educators were working really late into the evening and spent many hours preparing for those. So just a huge appreciation for everyone who makes that happen as well. Just really appreciative for everyone in our district and all of the work and energy you put forth. Um, hopefully folks have some time to rest later this month. Um, I share the same sentiments that a lot of my board members do and after hearing this um, you know this message and it's a reality where we are at and it's not something that is uh, brings us happy happy news but I want to remind us to you know remain um, kind to one another as we work through these challenges let's continue to see the the human side of ours and um, make sure we find that balance where we're physically and re uh, financially responsible but also respecting our educators and classified staff uh, across the entire district so that uh, we can provide the, the most resources that we can as a district and continue to improve on that. Um, I also want to just say that um, I have full confidence in our superintendent um, in leading this work that she's done, gathering these community um, meetings where we got to hear from our communities and just again, all the support from all the educators and support staff that put those together, really appreciate it. Uh, let's move forward and um, let's try to find a resolution sooner than later. Thank you all, thanks. Thank you. I guess I can go ahead <laughs> a little. The same, uh, but, but again, for working so hard and coming out and speaking and sharing your thoughts because that takes courage and time and we know that and we know that each teacher gives their all every day and staff member and you're, I believe that you're in this occupation because you, you have love in your heart and you're passionate about what you do and that is reflected now. And I hope that at least some of our words will resonate with you because as you mentioned, 
we are human and uh, and we know that you are too. And even though our position here, again, is tough and may come off uh, perceived in different ways, uh, I really just want you to know that that we are trying our best for you. And that's why we're here. So thanks again for the time. Thank you, Director Hudson. Thank you all board directors, um, Superintendent Castaneda and the team here present today. It is now 847 and our meeting is adjourned. She left because she's in.